Excellent, the live button has come up. So welcome everyone to this parallel session on food, diet, land and water. Um, as you have gathered yesterday, I think the format of the parallel sessions is we have two speakers and um, we have speaker one followed by speaker two with time for questions at the end of the session. So please do uh, use the question and answer box to pose your questions and any comments, and then we'll pick those up at the end and, um, and have some discussion. And of course, if time runs over, we'll be transferring or, or can bring those discussions into the discussion boards once the session's ended. So um, without taking up too much time, I want to introduce now our first speaker, uh, Sarah Bridal, who's a professor at the University of Manchester. And Sarah works on, on food and climate change and cosmology, which is a fantastic uh, combination. And, and as she says in her bio, she's diversified from astrophysics into agriculture and food research, motivated by the need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I'm very pleased to welcome her to the stage and, and to introduce her talk on how much do different food choices contribute to climate change. So over to you, Sarah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed for inviting me. Yeah, and, and I think that actually not many people know that this beautiful climate strikes was also produced by a former astrophysicist, uh, Ed Hawkins, um, that uh, made this brilliant visualization of climate change. Um, yeah, so I'm going to talk about how different foods contribute to climate change. And my main motivation really is to get some you know, quality information into the discussion about what to do about mitigating uh, climate change in terms of dietary and choices and also the way that we produce foods uh, and to get that, that that information injected into the conversation along with health and convenience and time and and money and that kind of thing um, so i'm going to give you a bit of background on why this is important and then i'm going to do some a uh, little sort of q a and um, you can do uh, work out, get a piece of paper and write down what you think are the answers to the questions I'm going to ask you. Um, and then I'm going to share some materials and all of this you're welcome to share with other people um, to try to sort of stimulate this kind of discussion that we need. Um, so if we add up all of the different contributions to climate change from all the different sectors, um, including clearing land for agriculture, um, growing crops, uh, putting fertilizers on the fields, uh, rearing animals, uh, production, transport, packaging, cooking and food waste, then that actually adds up to be about a quarter or over a quarter of all climate change. So clearly we need to address this green part, the three quarters, uh, we need to stop burning fossil fuels. But when we do that, food is going to be the biggest contributor to climate change. And also this red part is getting bigger as there are more people eating more greenhouse gas emissions intensive foods. So I think that in the next 10 years, hopefully, we're going to um, massively reduce our fossil fuel usage and food is going to be the most important thing that we're all talking about in terms of climate change. On the other hand, if we don't uh, stop burning fossil fuels uh, or massively reduce, then food is going to be affected by climate change very significantly uh, with just globally decreasing crop yields, but also extreme weather events over multiple continents at once, uh, causing uh, potentially very low harvests across large areas, which would be a big impact on, on food, but also potentially more, more um, politically as well. And just if you're into the detailed numbers like I am, I am, then this is just a graphic showing you all the background information for the graphic I just showed you. Um, just uh, showing food here, contributing quarter of all climate change, which is bigger than, say, heating or, or transport put together there. And if you look very closely, you can see that the majority of the non-food emissions are from fossil fuels, but the, the food emissions are mostly not fossil fuels and are not going to go away when we uh, use clean energy. There's many reports on this topic. Um, I know Claire's involved in, in, in this um, one blue dot and the British Dietitians Association uh, recommendations, uh, what we can do about this. Uh, the Committee on Climate Change has highlighted dietary choices as a major uh, potential for uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions and looking at how we go about educating and, and propagating that information down the food supply chain. And reports like the Eat Lancet report comparing their uh, recommended diet with what we're actually eating. And we can see that we're eating a lot more uh, red meat here, starchy vegetables and a lot less whole grains, uh, legumes than, than, we, than they recommend. 
Um, so just to take a step back for a moment, how much greenhouse gas emissions do you think that you're responsible for in an average day? So an average global citizen causes about six kilograms of carbon dioxide equ equivalent to go up into the atmosphere every day due to the food that they eat. And so I could probably lift uh, six kilograms if I tried, um, but it's still quite a lot. And in terms of, uh, say, volume, then that's, um, you know, it's a few hundred party balloons worth of greenhouse gases going up into the atmosphere every day. Um, and if we want to be in line with uh, international agreements, we might want to halve that in the next 10 years down to about three kilograms. So I'm going to use this as a kind of yardstick as we go through. OK, so... No prizes for guessing which do you think causes the most greenhouse gas emissions out of an eight ounce steak and chips or a microwave potato and beans. Uh, but most people are quite surprised at how big the difference can be. And so for an average European piece of steak, um, then that turns out that difference turns out to be over 20 times uh, difference. And you can see that the steak and chips here is causing more than our daily target even without including breakfast and lunch. So the main takeaway here, and this is just an illustration of how different foods cause very different amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's really good news, because if all foods contributed about the same, then we would be stuck. And what you can see already is that just by looking at quantities and maybe sharing that steak between two people, then you could already make a big difference to greenhouse gas emissions. Here's some other examples. So um, have a guess, uh, have a think, what do you think causes the most greenhouse gas emissions out of a bowl of cereal, um, a large latte or two boiled eggs? So have a think about that. And also have a think, how different do you think those options might be? And how much of this daily budget do you think each option might use up? So here's the answers and everything here is on the same scale, which actually means that we can't even see very well the, the, the greenhouse gas emissions from producing and transporting and processing the coffee uh, or heating the milk or the sugar. In fact, milk is the largest contributor to this large latte containing a pint of milk, which is a 500 ml large latte in a, in a coffee shop. Um, on the other hand, for the bowl of cereal here, if we use the recommended 200 mils of milk, then we, we have a correspondingly lower greenhouse gas emissions. And that's actually similar to the, the boiled eggs where we've got eggs produced by chickens, feeding the chickens. Some of that feed is soy, which is contributing to deforestation, which adds in there. And of course, you're familiar with cows, I'm sure, burping methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas. About 5% of all the calories eaten by a cow are burped out as methane. So that latte is using up a significant fraction of our daily budget, even though it might be the first drink of the day. Um, OK, Oops, so have a think about this one. A lot of people are surprised to find that actually a cheese sandwich for an average piece of cheese causes more greenhouse gas emissions than a chicken sandwich, even though it's vegetarian. Um, and then peanut butter and jam sandwich here. You can hardly see this uh, because it's so small. And that does include uh, producing uh, the peanuts and also shipping them as well. And here's another example. Um, if you've read the fantastic book, How Bad Are Bananas by Mike Berners-Lee, then you won't be surprised. I don't want to spoil that book for you, but the answer is um, not that bad. Um, so uh, you can see here that all of these snacks are relatively small greenhouse gas emissions uh, compared to this daily budget. Um, and so even the shipping of the banana, which is this tiny, tiny purple line here, um, isn't a big, big contributor to climate change. It takes about one causes about 100 times as much climate impact to bring something by air compared to by ship. So when things are coming by ship, it's relatively efficient. OK, and then finally, um, have a guess which do you think causes the most climate impact out of spaghetti bolognese, uh, a chicken curry and rice or fish and chips? And 
the takeaway from this actually for me is that all of these are relatively large compared to the previous slides. So dinner might be the first place to really think about uh, for most people. And you can see here that the, the beef itself causing a large fraction of the spaghetti bolognese emissions, that's for about 125 grams of beef, like a quarter of one of those 500 grams packs. Um, and you can see here the chicken tikka masala, chicken and also dairy products in the sauce. And the cod is actually from the diesel, largely from the diesel of, of that ship and taking it to sea processing and bringing back the cod. Uh, and you can see also that depending on what we put into that spaghetti bolognese, then we could have quite a big difference on the greenhouse gas emissions. So, um, for example, swapping uh, some of that, the beef for the chicken or swapping some of the beef for lentils or, or just bulking it out with more pulses and vegetables would automatically reduce the quantity of beef and maybe uh, not lose too much of the flavour. And if you like charts like this, you can find lots of things like this. And there's a free version of my book. So thanks to the fun funding from the University of Manchester. So I'm not, not trying to get your money here, but I um, do want to get this message out. And that's why I wrote the book. Uh, we've also doing research on, on how different foods contribute to climate change. You can see a typical UK day of food here and how much is caused by different parts of our diets and also the cooking impacts. So in fact, cooking impacts, um, particularly from switching a whole big metal box uh, on like an oven uh, to heat up a small amount of food, it's relatively inefficient if fossil fuels are used for that. And just to advertise a sister project to um, Claire's project called F Fix Our Food. Um, this is one of the big transforming food production uh, systems uh, projects funded by the UK UKRI. And we're looking at the Yorkshire food system and looking at how we can transform farming, also the food supply chain and looking particularly at schools and, and how we supply food to schools. I'd love to con be in contact with you about that. Um, and just finally, to just advertise some free free materials that we've developed to talk about this topic with the public that we hope you'll find useful. And this is our project called Take a Bite Out of Climate Change. We originally set it up for the Royal Society Summer Science Exhibition. You can see our stand there. And we blew up all these balloons, there's 50 balloons there, and asked people, how much uh, beef do you think you need to eat to cause this amount of greenhouse gas emissions? And people would guess like one gram or a whole cow. Uh, for an average European piece of steak, then it's about uh, 50 grams. So about half a beef burger sort of sized. A piece of beef to cause that amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we made this game, uh, Climate Food Challenge. It's, it's a bit addictive, so I'll just warn you now, you have to guess which is the least, the next highest, and the highest uh, greenhouse gas emissions out of the three foods, and then it keeps repeating it. It's quite a good, good way at a science festival to sort of grab people with iPads and get people who are not necessarily or, already interested in the topic just engaged, and then they start asking questions. Uh, we also made these uh, climate food flashcards, which you can download and print out for free. Um, and they're showing the greenhouse gas emissions of different foods and also converting that into the equivalent number of minutes driving a car. So you can see here, for example, a sausage, um, that's two, two small sausages, 100 grams of sausage, would cause about the same climate impact as driving a car for six minutes. And people can play like top trumps games with this or they make up their own games like play your cards right and things in schools um, when we're working with schools. And you can find all of the original data for all of this online, all referenced back to the original literature. Um, we've also, these have been translated into different languages and we're working on a project with, with India where we are uh, also converted the, the, the types of food as well to be culturally relevant. Um, and you can also go to this uh, Take a Bite Out of Climate Change website and use our calculator where you put the food item in and then you can also see the breakdown of how the different elements add up there for this latte that we looked at earlier. And you can even add your own foods and adjust the quantities and so on. Um, and then finally, we also put this together this time last year in lockdown. Uh, my kids have just come home for homeschooling again, so maybe we're not quite out of lockdown yet. But um, this is uh, Take a Bite Out of Climate Change at Home, 
Um, we put out a new video every weekday in June, um, interviewing experts on this topic, um, producing worksheets. For example, we made a worksheet on transport. And you can see here um, that Fairway Primary School has done a diagram here showing the transport emissions for flying strawberries compared to trucking strawberries. Um, so that's getting a bit of intuition about the different options. And then trying to like do a worksheet about how different foods uh, contribute, uh, making your lunch out of like choosing toast or bread and then choosing beans or cheese and then choosing air freighted or in season strawberries and adding up those numbers and maybe adding up the protein, um, the, the calories and so on and the fiber and, and seeing how those numbers add up and seeing if you could improve it. And you could do the same thing with, with all the flashcards as well. So um, that's just a sort of overview and um, we're really looking to, to bring this to more people. So it would be really um, great to hear from you. Thanks for listening. And if you want to sign up for our mailing list for very infrequent but important updates, then you can go here. Thank you. Fantastic. Many thanks, Sarah, and, and for keeping so closely to time. That's, that's really wonderful. And then um, I see in, in the question and answer, there's, there's a huge amount of discussion going on, which is which is great. It's going to make my job challenging pulling questions out, of course, later on, but I'm trying to keep a note as we go. And um, we can always bring, I think when we get to the discussion point, people can always um, pop a question back in if you want to bring it bring it back to the top of the list as we go. But let's see see how the discussion goes. But without any further ado, let's move on now to our, to our second speaker. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Claire Pessinger, who's a lecturer in public health dietetics here at the University of Plymouth. And she works on community focused research around food systems, poverty and social justice. So I um, very much look forward to welcoming you to the stage, Claire, to talk about Food Plymouth, the role of local food partnerships in tackling the climate emergency. So I uh, hand the floor to you, Claire. Thank you and good morning everyone. It's great to be here today at this fantastic conference and great to follow um, Professor Sarah Bridal. Um, so I'd like to um, just acknowledge my Food Plymouth colleagues who assisted me with this presentation this morning. What I'm talking about is a great passion of mine, which is where my academic role overlaps with my community activist role. So this is what I'm going to be covering. I'm going to be giving a little bit about context, the food system and climate and how these two things link. I'm then going to be talking about the UK context in terms of food partnerships, the, the UK national um, picture. And then I'm going to bring it down to the local and I'm going to be saying a little bit about Food Plymouth and all the action that's happening on the ground. So first on to context. We know that food sits at the centre of health, social, environmental, ethical and other interactions and concerns. I heard this morning um, that, you know, when we think about all the various interactions, we need to be taking a whole food systems approach, considering that entire process of food, which includes agricultural production, transport, packaging, consumption and, of course, waste. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, this is hot off the press. Um, this is a word cloud that was created from 35 participants at a workshop that I hosted at the start of the week at another conference. When they were asked for one word to describe the UK food system, this is what they came up with. And I think what this does is it reminds us starkly of the perceived state of our food system amongst academics and food scholars and others. To say a bit more about this then, um, when we take into consideration farming, production, distribution, delivery through to waste, our current food system currently contributes up to 30% of total greenhouse gas emissions in the UK, is a leading cause of deforestation, biodiversity loss, soil and water pollution, accounts for up to 70% of all human water use. 10 million tonnes of food produced or spoiled is wasted every year in the UK, with the majority, 70%, occurring in the home, and most of this is avoidable. Overfishing and poor fishing practices have impacted on fishing stocks, with up to 85% of fisheries now fully exploited. And we know that agriculture and livestock farming are by far the biggest contributors to greenhouse gas emissions, deforestation, biodiversity loss, etc. But culturally and socially, our food preferences are very much based on high livestock and dairy production. So as our population grows and the estimated growth 
is from you know seven seven billion to up to ten billion um, people by 2050. The demand for food will also grow. That means more food needs to be grown and produced, which means more greenhouse gas emissions and depletion of the planet's natural resources. And of course, this is exas exacerbated by the increasing urbanisation of populations and increasing wealth, which ultimately leads to an increased demand of those environmentally burdensome beef and dairy food. So I suppose the context is looking pretty bleak, as we already know, but the evidence is overwhelming on how our food system contributes to the climate emergency. Now, just to link to the global agenda briefly, you can see here in this table how food is related to many of the sustainable development goals. And in fact, my topic area, which focuses on nutrition specifically, was highlighted in 2017 in the Global Nutrition Report, which showcased how nutrition aligns with every one of those 17 goals and how it's an opportunity to tackle malnutrition in all its forms to support health, economic, social and political growth. So that's a quick whistle stop tour of context. But now I want to move on to the national UK picture and talk a little bit about the sustainable food places movement. So sustainable food places is one of the fastest growing social movements in the UK today. <clears throat> it's a network that brings together pioneering food partnerships from towns, cities, boroughs, districts and countries across the UK all of whom are driving innovation and best practice on all aspects of healthy and sustainable food. It's a partnership programme led by the Soil Association, Food Matters and Sustain, the Alliance for Better Food and Farming, and it's funded by the Esme Fairbairn Foundation and the National Lottery Community Fund. So the, the network helps to establish cross-sector food partnerships involving um, all players, local authority, public sector bodies, et cetera, developing a vision, strategy and action plan for making healthy and sustainable food a defining characteristic of where they live and working together to realise that, that vision through concerted and coordinated action across the food system. Now, what you'll see here is that the Sustainable Food Partnership, um, Partnership Network takes a systems approach to food with six key issues, creating a framework for action for local food partnerships. We have good food, good governance, food governance and strategy, good food movement, healthy food for all, sustainable food economy, catering and procurement and food for the planet. So I ask you, if you live in the UK, do you know where your nearest sustainable food place is? And that's one of my um, suggestions to you that if you don't know that we've got 60 network members and many, many people across the UK involved. So perhaps your first action following this conference is to find out and make connections to support your local food partnership who are doing some excellent work on the ground. Now, the network have created an award scheme which is designed to recognise and celebrate the success of those places who are taking up a joined up holistic approach to food and that are achieving significant positive changes on a range of key food issues. <clears throat> To bring that into the southwest then, now I'm very involved in Food Plymouth, which I'm going to say a little bit about in a while, but we've also got a lot of activity going on in Cornwall and with a specific focus of some of the work they've done through the pandemic, there's been a proliferation of emergency food aid activity in Cornwall to meet the spiralling demand thrown by, by COVID, salvaging as much as possible from hospitality dependent food producers whose surplus was otherwise destined for waste disposal. So Cornwall are building new stronger partnerships to, to make the food system more resilient and regenerative. We also have Food Exeter who are doing very similar work and established network. And we've got this very exciting new development called the Devon Food Partnership, which is a new endeavour to join up the work being done across the county. So lots of activity in the southwest. And I'm going to focus now on some of the excellent work of Food Plymouth specifically. So Food Plymouth is the city's recognised local food partnership a central connecting hub for all food related matters in the city. We have a multi-sector award-winning partnership which was founded in 2010. I've been involved since its inception and it comprises a diverse mix of agencies, organisations, businesses, citizens, community groups etc who are all working together to actively promote and lobby for healthy, sustainable and affordable food as a driver for positive change. <clears throat> 
The collaborative work of the Food um, Plymouth Partnership is expressed through the six strands of our action plan, each of which focuses on transfect of the food system. And the six themes are illustrated in our symbolic lighthouse diagram here. Food Plymouth um, is, is um, the Food Plymouth Partnership is facilitated and resourced by the Community Interest Company. We are a bronze sustainable food place and we are currently working towards our silver award and I'm going to say a little bit about that later. But what I'm going to do now very quickly is showcase one or two examples from each of the six strands of our action plan, a very brief overview, but I will direct you to the marketplace which is happening after this section which should be able to give you a little bit more information. Each strand of Food Plymouth's work is aligned with one or more of the pillars of sustainability. <clears throat> so firstly, healthy food for all. Tackling food poverty, diet-related ill health and access to affordable healthy food. I'm flagging two examples here. The Plymouth Aid Redistribution Centre was launched in January 2021 in response to COVID to support access to good quality food and other essentials, as well as providing increased storage for large deliveries of supply food into the emergency food aid network. Plymouth has a, a very strong and thriving local food aid network, which is a collection of various partners, food support providers, local growers, distributors, etc., who are all seeking to combat food insecurity across the city. Secondly, the Plymouth Food Equality Project is a project that I've been leading in the city and it's a community project funded by Food Power, which aims to get communities talking about food, food system and food insecurity so that local people themselves are involved in co-creating their own shared solutions. And we've used a range of creative methods as tools for engagement to get conversations going, capturing conversations around availability of healthy food, the cost of food, holiday hunger, shopping habits, all the issues that we've seen that have been exacerbated during COVID. Next, we're talking about the good food movement, building public awareness, active food citizenship and a local good food movement. In order to drive a shift towards healthier and more sustainable food requires high public awareness of food issues and widespread participation in food related activity by individuals and institutions as part of a growing movement. An example I'm giving here is Food is Fun CIC and one of our close partners who work towards this. They deliver a range of activities aimed predominantly at children and young people, families, cookery, nutrition, budgeting, etc. And more importantly, du during, during the pandemic, they set up a, a, a um, a facilitated network, a Facebook group called Food Buddies Southwest, which was a, a way of supporting each other um, with food during the pandemic. So the next example relates to the sustainable food economy, creating a vibrant, prosperous and diverse sustainable food economy. Sustenance is a project locally which strives to develop local food economies that work for everyone, food that's sustainable, affordable, tasty and healthy. It brought partners, Food Plymouth, Mutual Credit Services with Tamar Grow Local with a mission to develop and try out new ideas in order to strengthen the local food economy in and around Plymouth, connecting producers, distributors and anyone who eats for the good of all. Next example is Food for the Planet, and I'm providing a couple of um, examples of projects here. The first is Generous Earth, a project that aims to make better use of resources and to support the growing of healthy, sustainable food across the city. This is being achieved through community composting and building a network of skillful composters, also developing earth repair experts in order to support the growth of abundance and diversity for both people and wildlife. And the second example here, preventing plastic pollution, a partnership with uh, between Food Plymouth and Plymouth City Council, running a range of local recent events, highlighting the harm that plastic food and drink packaging can do to our precious environment. The next, is catering and procurement, transforming catering and procurement and revitalizing local and sustainable food supply chains. The example I'm sharing here is our local active partner, CaterEd, who have put Plymouth on the map by setting up an innovative school meals service for the city of Plymouth using a cooperative trading company process whereby the service is jointly owned by 67 local schools in Plymouth City Council 
providing high quality school food whilst also considering local and seasonal sustainable sourcing and more sustainable procurement practices. We're also working with other organisations and businesses locally and, and larger Plymouth institutions, for example, the University and Derryford Hospital, to support them with their move towards better catering and procurement practices. So the final of the six strands of the framework <clears throat> is good uh, food governance and strategy. This is about taking a strategic and collaborative approach to good food governance and action. In order to transform a, a, a food culture, food system requires a joined up strategic approach and committed long term collaboration between individuals and organisations across every sector and at every level from community grassroots and third sector organisations to business and council leaders. And the key to achieving this is a strong cross sector food partnership and an inspiring and ambitious food vision backed by a clear strategy and action plan. Now, Food Plymouth has been working hard for this over its 10 years, not without challenges along the way, but we're determined in our resolve and we're currently at the early stages of working towards our silver award. And this is where this is a call, of, call to action. If you feel you can help or you want to support, then please do get in touch because we want to build our capacity to make this success for the city of Plymouth. And please also do visit the, the Food Plymouth Marketplace. So just to round off then really, um, Food Plymouth is about collaboration, engaging with our network partners to build collective social impact. Food Plymouth is about food citizenship, citizens participating in a, and in shaping their own food environment. It's about connectivity, connecting people to their food and the food system. Food Plymouth is about community, a building strong and positive relationships, using food as a positive vehicle to bring people together. It's about compassion, celebrating, embracing models of compassionate action for social change. We're about creativity, using creative approaches to build food justice and resilience, especially post-COVID and Brexit. And of course, overarching here, this is about the climate emergency and all the work that we do is underpinned by that. So to round off then, food intersects disciplinary boundaries and because it sits at the centre of health, social, environmental, ethical, political concerns, we need to involve all players in the food system. Our food choices do need to change and this has been established through what, what, what Sarah has said as well. Um, but this is not an, just an individual responsibility, it is a shared responsibility. So we need to be taking responsibility across the players in the food system. We need to particularly place a focus on supporting the most vulnerable citizens in society to enable them to embrace change. But I believe local food partnerships play a vital role to tackle the climate emergency because they represent a social movement which includes voices and power of already active citizens who are lobbying for healthy and sustainable food across the system. So, and, and I'm already working with Food Plymouth as a partner in my research. So please do seek out your local food partnerships, find out more about what they're doing, be part of this social movement because this is all about how we can use food and our broken food system in a more positive way to catalyse transformational change to tackle the climate emergency. Thank you very much. Many thanks, Claire. That's fantastic. I think between you, we've had this wonderful journey from, from concepts and ideas into the practical actions of, of what can be done. So it's been a really, really, really fruitful session. Um, there's, there's a lot of discussion coming through. Um, what I'd like to do is try to, we've got 11 minutes, which is great for discussion. Um, I've tried to keep track as we go along. And I think to start with, I thought it'd be nice to open with some of the discussion on, on, the, on the metrics of sustainable diets. So there's quite, quite a lot of questions there um, about sources of data, variability, representativeness, and so on. Of course, you know, you need to capture sort of what, what, what the, the, the typical is. Um, and so I, I guess, Sarah, firstly to you, but also Claire, do chip in as well. Um, Maybe I'll, I'll hit you with all of the components that I, that I thought I captured, and you can answer them in, in the order you feel is best. Um, so one question was about nutrient density and bioavailability and how that fits into the, alongside the, the sort of the, the carbon and other emission metrics. 
There are questions about the livestock data and in industrial indoor farms versus pasture fed, grass fed versus grain fed, and how does that inform, inform choice? And then questions about dairy milk versus plant-based milks and so on. So, so quite a lot of, I guess there's a lot of common concepts within there. Those are the, the, the threads that were put up. So I don't know if you can comment, Sarah, on those on the metric side and representativeness, that would be fantastic. Yeah, great. If it's possible to share this, this, the slide I've just put up, that'd be really helpful. Yeah, yeah. So I noticed that somebody had put a link to our, our world in data, which is a fantastic website on many, many topics, including a brilliant piece they did on, on food. Um, so this just to illustrate from one of the plots from their website to illustrate some of the answers to some of those questions. So it's absolutely right that there is a big range in the greenhouse gas emissions, depending on how food is produced. And so, for example, you can see here um, beef is giving a big range there, depending on how it's produced. And some of the range is due to the way that the beef is, is, is fed. Um, so if we have grass fed beef, as was mentioned in, the, in some of the questions, then actually it causes more greenhouse gas emissions in terms of it's about 6% of calories are burped out as methane if the cow is grass fed, compared to about 3% of calories if the cow is fed on soy and wheat and the, the, the farmed products. Um, however, on the other hand, if you're going to grow food um, in, in deforested regions in order to feed those cows, then that, that counterbalances that, that benefit. So there is a difference. It does depend on how the cows are bred. And also for, you know, if the, if the manure is housed versus on the fields, then it can bring it down. But on the other hand, you can also see that even for the most efficiently produced beef, then it's still, uh, you know, it's still up here compared to some of the other uh, foods that we could be eating. So there is a range, but it's still, there's still big differences between different types of food. That's the sort of overview. Excellent, thank you. That, that fits quite nicely into another another question that was made or, or a point that was made that BrewDog um, the brewery adds, add carbon emission data to their to their menus. And I guess in some ways it's, you know, what do consumers need? Do we need do we need the hard data, like you described the range, or do we need kind of a more of a sort of a traffic light system? I'm not sure if you have comments on on, on that approach. And it, I guess it, it, it crosses over a bit into your work as well, Claire, in terms of badging and labelling, you know, giving consumers that sort of immediate insight into what they're buying so they can make an informed choice rather than being bamboozled by too many numbers. Yeah, absolutely. Shall, shall I go first and then Claire after that? Yeah, yeah okay. Yeah. So yeah, so so that that graph illustrates the fact that actually, you know, I can tell you the average numbers that you know that I've just just illustrated, but actually, you know, you probably want to know as a consumer, you're very concerned consumers probably on this call, you probably want to know, you know, do I choose this piece of beef or that piece of beef or this piece of uh, chicken or that piece of chicken? So there's there's um, you know information is not there at the moment generally apart from on uh, just a few products and, and brew dog menus, so I would personally love to see that information. Uh, I'm a numbers geek, you know, that's what I like. Um, I take very long time at the supermarket, but <laughs> I do love to see the numbers. However, you know, the, the reason for putting the numbers there is not really because we're expecting every consumer to look at every number when they go, you know, on every shopping trip. It actually has an impact beyond what the consumers do. So, for example, if we look at, say, um, sugar labels, when we have the traffic lights for sugar, they change the, uh, the threshold between orange and red. Um, and they gave you know companies a warning for this, and actually companies reformulated so that they didn't end up switching from the orange to the red category. So labels with information on them have a big impact, even if individual consumers don't look at them. Thank you, Sarah. Claire, did you want to add something? Yeah, I'll just I'll just say, say a small amount. Yeah, that that that's really interesting. I think from our kind of citizen perspective or consumer, there's, there's, there is a nuance difference between those two terms. Um, I think we do need to make information accessible to individuals for those that are, are need to find out more. I mean, from my perspective as a public health nutritionist, labelling is an absolute minefield. I mean, mm. you, you know, you, you start talking about healthy, balanced um, food using kind of eat well guide and traffic lights. And then once you start incorporating more factors into that, it just becomes even more complex. So I guess it's a tricky balance between what is essential and what is um, what is desired by by those citizens. And I think it was interesting that somebody I noticed in the chat when Sarah was talking, was talking about climate anxiety 
and we get it a lot in in, in the nutrition world as well that that sometimes when there's too much information people just shut off and, and, and don't want any information at all so I think we need to be very mindful of of that anxiety and and how more information can can kind of accentuate that so so there's a real fi fine line here and I'm, I'm not sure I, I certainly don't have the answers but some of the work that we've been doing certainly in the Sustainable Earth Institute is around working perhaps with creative partners to to kind of translate some of the complex numbers and and things and 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 translate them into accessible ways that 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 the public and and citizens can understand them and that's you know infographics and somebody had mentioned apps and and, and that sort of things so i think there are ways of doing it but we just have to be careful yeah i'm glad you brought the anxiety one up actually that was my that was going to be my next question for you claire um and I guess in some ways, is it about, you know, I really like the idea of, the, I love top trumps, I play top trumps a lot with my kids. And I like the idea of, in some ways, it's about raising, once the, the raise, awareness is raised in, in a consumer's mind, then then it becomes more, we become more thoughtful about what we buy. And in some ways, then the numbers become less relevant and we become more more thoughtful in our decision making. And certainly, I think the, for me, the balance of, you know, we can still eat meat, but if we can balance it with something else, actually, we can make a quite a substantial reduction by halving the quantity that we eat. So I think there's some really powerful messaging in there. Um, did, yeah, sorry. Go ahead. Did you want to? Yeah, I, 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 I think I was. I, I was going to bring in just that that nuance about some of the work that I do with more disadvantaged communities because I think the messages that are currently out there are are. are ten <laughs> I have to be careful what I say here. Are, 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 we're, it's like we're preaching to the converted, and I know that in in the space that I work within within Food Plymouth. But one, the 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 sister project that I'm doing, one of the food system transformation consortia project that Sarah referred to, I'm I'm doing one that's read led by the University of Reading. And we are looking at um, um, co-production of healthy, sustainable food systems for disadvantaged communities. And I can I can tell you now that adding that nuance of, of what's appropriate and what's um, desirable from, from, from communities that are harder to reach that perhaps aren't represented in our national data sets becomes um, a really challenging task indeed. So I, I think there's there's a real sense that, again, you know, we don't really know what's happening on the ground and with heavy reliance on emergency food aid, we look at slightly different supply chains as well. So, so there's a lot of really interesting nuances there to consider when we're thinking about those more disadvantaged communities that are, are particularly failed by the food system as it is currently. Yeah, Sorry, I could... I'm I could, invasion by a puppy behind me, noise. Oh, I just want to to really sort of echo what what Claire was saying um, in 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 your talk, Claire, when you said about you know we need systemic change, not just individual action. So I think that you know individual action is really important because actually a small fraction of consumers can end up driving quite a lot of action. Um, but on the other hand, that that those those consumers need to drive systemic change. You know, for example, if we look at what happened with plastics, you know, five years in the last five years, what we've seen is that. You know many issues but what's happened is that consumers are now driving food uh, sorry, pa plastic packaging uh, changes you know supermarkets are shouting about their wonderful plastic you know uh, approaches food producers are running around trying to ditch plastic governments are able to bring in policies about plastic use and i'd love to see that same kind of step change in enthusiasm for new food policies, which I think can be a bit of a toxic subject. So, but we need the consumers to, and citizens, sorry, to be behind this. Yeah, that, that's, I mean, that that's my take, is this is about putting citizens at the heart of, of this systemic change. And I think that's a really challenging, complicated thing to do. But this week I've been in, engaged in a few conferences and and I, I think that, that looking at the, the the, the the effect of covid on food insecurity and and that the, the 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 kind of precarity of the food system has really shone a light on everything that's bad with it really and, and we know that we don't need to be told that the crisis on a crisis um you know so, so this is urgent action is 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 needed and and i absolutely agree we need to be putting citizens at the heart um, at, at all levels, um, you know, wh whether it's working on the ground, individual change or, or kind of social, cultural, physical, food environment change or policy levels. So I think we've we've got our work cut out for us, haven't we, Sarah? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Absolutely. I think we're, we're, we're right up against the time now. So um, at that point, I think I'd like to say 
thank you once again to both of you for some really stimulating talks, fantastic interaction with the uh, with the audience through the questions and answers. And and I think if we can bring some of these topics across to the discussion boards and continue there, that would be fantastic. So so many many thanks again, and thank you very much for the participation from the audience.